In this module, we're going to talk about flavors and flavoring and how to use them. The objectives for this module are explain the basic physiology of the senses of taste and smell, describe how flavoring ingredients can create, enhance, or alter the natural flavors of a dish, identify a variety of herbs, spices, salts, oils, vinegars, condiments, alcoholic beverages, and other flavorings, Describe the flavor principles of a variety of international cuisines. So what is flavor? Flavor is a combination of tastes, aromas, and other sensations caused by the presence of a foreign substance in the mouth. Flavor is to food as what hue is to color and what timbre is to music. Taste is the sensation we detect when a substance comes in contact with our taste buds on the tongue. They consist of five different tastes. Sweet, which we're taught from birth to be adjusted toward. Bitter, which we're taught to absolutely not be adjusted toward. As a matter of fact, typically bitter is thought of as poison. Salty, which we are one of those flavors that we naturally crave because our body craves salt. Sour, which is a puckering or an, a citric taste to it, which gives us a nice enhancement. And something called umami. Umami is a little bit different than the rest because technically it equates to savory more than anything else. So really, in order to discuss flavor, we have to first discuss the human olfactory system. Now, we know what the five tastes are. But without the olfactory system, we can't determine the flavor of something. All we can determine is whether it is sweet, salty, sour, bitter, or umami. Once we place the substance in our mouth, the aromas are delivered through the retronasal path. Olfactory neurons at the top of the nasal cavity are clustered together in the olfactory bulb. In short, if you can't breathe, you can't taste. Taste buds are specialized sensory organs, which are found on the tongue within three different kinds of small bumps, known as papilla, as well as the back of the throat and the roof of the mouth. It's a common misconception that you only taste food in certain areas of the tongue. We grew up believing that the tongue has four taste zones, one for sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. But this is not the case. These tastes, along with the fifth taste called umami or savory, can be sensed in all parts of the tongue. The sides of the tongue are more susceptible or sensitive overall than the middle, and the back of the tongue is more sensitive to bitter tastes. There are five factors affecting flavor perception. Temperature. When we think of this, we have to think of something like oh, body temperature. Something that is body temperature, 98.6 degrees, is more readily identified by the body and easily digest. However, we also have to think about things such as saltiness. We want to season the food at the temperature we're going to serve the food. Consistency. The thickness or viscosity of a food is going to play a factor as well. If it has a thickness to it, it has what we call mouthfeel. And that will aid in the flavors contributing all around the mouth. The presence of contrasting tastes. This is a little bit unique in the fact that we don't want all one flavor. The commercial that came out a few years ago is something about sweet and sour soup. You wouldn't want just sour soup. You want sweet and sour soup. The presence of fat. Often misquoted, Fat is not flavor. Fat is a vehicle for flavor. Fat has no flavor by itself, but the presence of fat will give it that mouthfeel again, that consistency we talked about earlier. And it will also provide a sense of satiety or fullness to us as well. And then finally, color. Color makes a big difference as far as how we perceive something, but also in how it tastes. A red bell pepper is going to be sweeter than a green bell pepper even though it is the same bell pepper that's just been allowed to ripen a little bit further. There are three compromises to the perception of taste. 
age is one of those things that will compromise your perception of taste, but also the underdevelopment of it as well. We're said when we're children to have a childlike palate, which means we eat very simple foods. Our taste buds have really not developed in this point. But as we age, our taste buds will develop and we, our tastes will change along with that. But as we get older in life, we diminish some of those taste buds. We diminish some of our sense of smell. And with that, we lose some of our taste. Health is also a factor if you are very sick or if you have any kind of head cold or if you are any kind of compromised, you may not be able to taste things very well. And smoking. Smoking is one of those things that people don't think about, and a lot of chefs in the industry do smoke, but what they do is they will often wash their mouth out before tasting food to be able to get that effect. Smoking not only affects your mouth and the area around your mouth, the smoke clings to your face and clings to your nose and gets all in the areas that usually are reserved for the smells of food, but it also numbs and deadens your taste buds in the process because of the heat that's drawn in through the smoking. There are five factors associated with flavoring foods. Factor number one, start with simple combinations of ingredients. Often the simplest combinations are the best. Factor number two, select fresh foods that are in season whenever possible. I like to say take the best ingredient you can find and do very little to it. Factor number three, match the flavoring used to both the ingredient and the cooking technique. Not all cooking techniques are designed for all different flavors. Some flavors are more delicate. Factor number four, prep techniques also impact the flavor of the food. The size of the cut affects the perception of taste and texture. And factor number five, the temperature of foods impacts the taste perception of the flavors as we discussed earlier. So let's talk about the difference between flavoring and seasonings. Flavorings is an item that adds a new taste to the food and alters its natural flavor. Flavorings include herbs and spices, vinegars and condiments. Most flavoring is done during the cooking process. Seasoning is an item added to enhance the natural flavor of a food without changing its taste. Salt is the most common seasoning. Most seasoning is done at the end of the cooking process. Oftentimes when we discuss flavor profiles, it's easier to refer to it as if it was a musical note. Top notes or high notes are the sharpest or the first flavors and aromas that you taste and smell. Middle notes is the second wave of flavors and is generally more subtle. Low notes or base notes are the most dominant lingering flavors that last for a while. The aftertaste or finish is that final flavor that hangs around after all the other flavors are gone. Roundness is the unity of the dish's various flavors, just like you don't play a single note, but you play a chord. And depth of flavor is the broad range of the flavors that are used in the dish. When dealing with working with flavors, chefs may rely on classic flavor combinations such as lamb with rosemary and garlic or apple pie with cinnamon. These are classic flavor combinations that have been around for a while. The reason they've been around for a while is because, well, they work. Chefs can also choose to amplify flavors, such as a steak sprinkled with a little kosher salt. This will not only bring up the flavor of the natural meats and the natural juices and the Maillard reaction, that caramelization on the outside of the steak, but will enhance those flavors as well without altering them or changing them in any way. Chefs may layer flavors, like adding a lemon rind, a lemon juice, and lemon basil to the dressing. Each one is added at a different time in the process, and because of this, they're going to have different interpretations in that recipe. They're going to come and go at different times in your, in your sensation of taste. 
So let's talk about some seasoning and flavoring guidelines. Flavoring should not hide the taste or aroma of the primary ingredient. Let the ingredients sing. Flavoring should be combined in balance so as not to overwhelm the palate. The last thing you want is something that's too salty or too bitter. Flavoring should not be used to disguise poor quality or poorly prepared products. If the soup is scorched, it's scorched and it should be thrown away. Flavoring should be added sparingly when foods are cooked over a long period of time. Because when foods are cooked over a long period of time, there are changes that are going to happen in that food as it cooks. If you start off by salting it to the desired salinity early on, then in the end result, it may end up being too salty. Taste and season your foods frequently during the cooking process. This is one of the biggest mistakes most chefs in the industry do, is they don't taste their food frequently enough. If at the end of your shift you are still hungry, you haven't tasted your food enough. International flavor principles are designed around certain criteria. The primary ingredients of the proteins and starches can change depending on the environment you're in. The proteins that are used in Asia are different than the proteins that are used in North America. Religious influences are a huge factor in the flavors of the world. Some flavors are heavily influenced on the traditions of halal or kosher. Some flavors are heavily influenced on religious holidays as well. The typical cooking methods used in the environment, such as a wok cooking versus a grill in the South. The cooking liquids which are used, some regions use fats, some regions use oils, some regions use uh, various different kinds of fats. Maybe they use pork fat versus chicken fat for other reasons. So the fats are going to play a big factor in that, not only in cooking, but also in the fats that are used in the dish itself. And then the flavorings that they use. The flavorings of India, for example, are a good example of this. They're bright and they're colorful and they have a lot of pungency to them. Whereas the flavors in certain other areas, say like Lower Asia uh, in China, are not necessarily as pungent. But they're very simple and simplistic in their nature. Let's talk about flavors from around the world. Every culture tends to combine a small number of flavoring ingredients so frequently and so consistently that they become distinctive of a particular cuisine. This has never been more true than in certain regions. Here in the United States, we tend to base our base level flavors on the French mirepoix, carrot, celery, and onion. We also have the trinity of the South Louisiana area. But in Greece, they have tomatoes and cinnamon or olive oil, lemon and oregano as base level flavors. In India, depending on where you are, in northern India, it may be cumin, ginger, and garlic. Where in the southern parts of India, it could be mustard seeds, coconut, tamarind, and chili. In Mexico, tomato and chili or lime and chili are common ingredients that you would find as base level flavorings. In Spain, the sofrito of Spain has tomatoes, onions, garlic, and olive oil all simmered together. And then in China, we have ginger, scallions, and garlic are going to be the base level flavors. Herbs are any of a large group of aromatic plants whose leaves, stems, or flowers are used as flavorings. They can be used either dry or fresh. Spices are any of a large group of aromatic plants whose bark, roots, seeds, buds, or berries are used as flavoring, usually used in a dry form, whole, or ground. Condiments are any item that are added to a dish to add flavor. For example, these include herbs and spices and vinegars. It also refers to cooked or prepared flavorings such as those prepared mustards, relishes, bottled sauces and pickles that we see at the grocery store. So let's examine salt. Salt has been historically 
one of the most important spices that have ever been around. They have fought wars over salt. It was used as currency in the past. Uh, salt was used to preserve food for long voyages on ships. So in essence, salt was life. There are a bunch of different varieties of salt, culinary salt or table salt as we refer to it. You often see those in the little round containers sitting on the shelves with the, the girl in the raincoat with the uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, this is also sometimes referred to as iodized salt because in the early 1900s, iodine was added to it to prevent the formation of goiters on the side of the neck. Rock salt is used uh, predominantly in things such as, well, making ice cream. We add rock salt to ice and it lowers the freezing temperature of it. Kosher salt is the preferred salt of the culinary industry. Not only is it a clean taste, but it has a large flaky texture that makes it really easy to detect how much we're using at a time. It flows through the fingers very nicely and gives us a tactile sensation. Sea salt is going to have the flavors of the ocean. It's going to have the flavors of the sea. Uh, it may be a little more briny tasting. It may have a little more of a earthy taste to it. Cell gris, or this is a salt which is also a sea salt style, uh, can be used in many cases. It's also typically going to be a little more gray. Fleur de sel is another example of this. And then we have specialty salts such as smoked salts. And uh, you might have a Himalayan salt. Uh, the pink salt that we see. Uh, you may have uh, flavored salts that are mixed together. So for instance, you might have a salt that is uh, mixed with uh, espresso grounds and it is an espresso salt. Or you may have a salt that has been uh, flooded with a burgundy wine and allowed to dehydrate and recrystallize into a burgundy salt. There are so many different salts out there in the supermarkets and I've gotten a lot of comments from you guys about what salts to use and what to do if you over or under salt your food. The most common salts I have over here, and this is iodized table salt. So this is what you typically see in restaurant shakers, or maybe you even have one of those on your kitchen table. And next to it, I have its cousin, I would say, and that is kosher salt, coarse kosher salt. Now, Going back to this normal table salt, it has iodine added to it, and that was in like the 1920s. Iodine was added to help prevent some devastating iodine deficiencies in the United States. This table salt is also really processed. You can tell by the texture here of the salt itself. It's very uniform um, and almost rounded in shape, and that means that the salt has undergone some processing that kind of knocks out all of the jagged edges of the salt crystal and makes it really easy to dissolve. So if you're cooking something, if you're putting it into pasta water, it dissolves really quickly. Now, kosher salt, kosher salt is something we here in the test kitchens love to use. Why? Because you can easily pinch it and sprinkle it on your foods. It has a coarse texture to it, but it's almost um, an irregular texture. There's some fine particles of salt, but there's also some bigger crystals here. Now in our recipes and in a lot of recipes, they'll call for coarse salt. And it's important that you take note of that. And if you don't have coarse salt in your kitchen and you want to substitute this table salt here or a finer salt, you need to be mindful and not use as much. So if a recipe calls for one teaspoon of coarse kosher salt and you're using table salt here, you probably want to start with at least half. So one more thing here, I've gotten a lot of questions about over or under salting, and my best piece of advice for you would be to season as you go. Season a little bit, taste it, does it need more salt? Maybe you should hold off. That's the best piece of advice, season as you go. So these are the two most common salts I would say that we use in the test kitchens, but out there, there are a lot of other salts that we like to call finishing salts. And finishing salts are kind of broken up into two different categories. There's either sea salts or there are mine salts. And 
Across the world, I would say that the production of salt comes from half from the sea and half from mining them out from the earth. Now, this salt I have here, this is actually a sea salt. It's one of our favorite finishing salts here in the test kitchen. It's called Malden salt. It comes from the south coast of England, and it has the biggest, most beautiful flakes to it. So it's extremely coarse. And that's part of the reason why we love it, because it does something that kosher and table salt it doesn't do. It gives texture to things. So if you're sprinkling this on a salad, or if you're finishing it over some grilled steak slices, this gives a wonderful crunch which is kind of an unexpected texture, but really delicious. And also it gives off a little bit of an extra flavor. So not only is it salty, but it has its own flavor to it because it picks up the flavor from its environments. Now, a cousin to this sea salt here is over here. This is called cell gris, meaning gray sea salt. And this comes from the west central part of France. And you can see it's characteristically gray because it picks up a lot of that color from the environment in which it's harvested. Now, it is harvested in what they call these salt ponds. And that is just an area or a marsh, I would say, of salty water. And what happens is evaporation takes place and all of the salinity, all of the salt starts to crystallize. Now, what floats to the top and forms as the purest crystals of salt is the cousin of cell gris. Uh, which is fleur de sel, meaning the flower of the salt. And you can see I have two versions here, uh, a very fine version of fleur de sel, and I also have a coarse version of it here. You can see there's a big difference in the color. It's much brighter and whiter in color, and the crystals are very beautiful on this coarse version I have over here. Now, this cell gris is actually the salt that kind of settles down in these um, evaporation pools. So it's manufactured in the same way, but one's kind of on top and one is on the bottom. In contrast to these sea salts, we have some other salts here that are colored salts, and they're called colored salts because they actually pick up the color from the environment in which they're harvested. So this is a Hawaiian black salt, and the black comes from the lava that it is surrounded with, so it's actually kind of mixed in with the salt as it's harvested, and that gives a really distinct flavor. You get a lot of mineral compounds, you get a lot of subtle earthy flavors to go along with it. This is Himalayan pink sea salt. It sounds kind of crazy, because we're in the Himalayan mountains, right? And where's the sea around it? But it's actually ancient seas have evaporated over time um, and all that salt is left behind and it picks up this wonderful hue, this pink color from the surrounding earth. Now, colored salts, we're gonna move on to flavored salts over here. There are countless flavored salts and these are actually combined with other ingredients, not necessarily naturally occurring um, in the environment in which they're harvested. So this is a green tea salt here. This is a truffle salt, but most popular, I would say, in the United States. There's celery salt, which people uh, typically use in their Bloody Marys. Lots of different flavored salts out there in the marketplace. These obviously have much more flavor. Now, the last salt I wanna talk about, and this is for all of the fans out there who love to pickle and preserve, this is pickling salt. And you can see pickling salt is very fine. It's very bright. It shines and it is a highly refined salt. So it's almost 100%, close to 100% sodium chloride. So very, very, very pure and it dissolves easily since it's so finely ground into your pickling or brining solution. So there you go, guys. I hope I've helped you out here with a very simple glossary of all of the different salts, what you should do with them, how you should season as you go. And there you go, guys. Enjoy, salt away, and of course, if you have any kitchen conundrums, reach out to us using the hashtag kitchen conundrums. We would love to hear from you. So there are some rules when you're dealing with salting food that you have to be aware of. Salt food sparingly to start. Salt foods in small increments as you cook. Cooks can perspire in the kitchen as well and therefore need more salt in their own bloodstreams. And when you go to taste the food, it can actually trick you into thinking it doesn't have enough salt in it. So you have to be very, very careful. Don't add too much salt to a dish to satisfy your own craving for salt because of this. 
and customers can always add more salt to the table. There are a rare select few of restaurants that don't include salt shakers on the table, but they are just that rare indeed. More salt can be needed in a dish that will be served cold because serving temperatures are going to affect the saltiness of something. If you serve it at a hot temperature, you want to season it at a hot temperature and vice versa. Oils are a type of lipid that remains liquid at room temperature. Cooking oils are refined from various seeds, plants, and vegetables. So the term vegetable oil is an interchangeable term. It could mean canola oil, safflower, sunflower, or any other kind of vegetable oil that is produced from a vegetable. So let's look at some of the most common forms of vegetable oil. Canola was originally a trademark name of the Rapeseed Association of Canada, and the name was condensed from can from Canada and ola from vegetable oils like mazola, but now is a generic term for edible varieties of rapeseed oil in North America and Australia. All olive oils are unique. Besides being able to come from several different varietals of olives, the growing conditions also have a factor on their flavors. Olive oils are broken down into categories. Extra virgin. Extra virgin olive oil is a virgin olive oil that has a low acidic level and is made from healthier ingredients. It's generally considered high quality olive oil and is most commonly used for its divine taste. Extra virgin olive oil is the healthiest and most flavorful grade of these several reasons. Its acidity level is the lowest, has less than about 1%, and its taste is fruity and light, allowing it to be used uncooked in salad dressings, soups, pastas, and as a dipping oil. It's naturally extracted, no chemical or preservatives are added, and comes from the first pressing of the olive fruit. It is a deep yellowish green in color. Premium extra virgin olive oil can also be purchased and is everything that normal extra virgin is, taken up a notch in quality. As well, cold pressed olive oil is the top of the line in terms of price and flavor. Virgin olive oil is regular virgin olive oil is extremely similar to extra virgin, but slightly less quality. It's also naturally pressed and extracted, but it contains a slightly uh, higher acidic level and a generally no higher than 2%. It taste remains of high quality, albeit less fruity, and is also great to use in dressings, marinades, pastas, etc. Virgin olive oil is commonly used for roasting vegetables or placing over corn on the cob while grilling. It is lighter and more golden in color. Virgin olive oils can be broken down into two more specific categories, fine and semi-fine. Fine virgin olive oil is, has the acidity of 1.5, while the semi-fine would be no more than 3.3. Fine extra virgin olive oil is a good option for shoppers on a budget who desire the taste of extra virgin. Uh, Semi-virgin olive oil is less quality and should not be consumed raw. Refined olive oil. This category of olive oil gets its name because of the additional refining techniques that are used to press the olives and create the oil. These additional refining methods are necessary in order to create a oil that is fit for human consumption. Oils that are over 3.3 and acidic are generally lacking the quality uh, that go through this process. Refined olive oils lack the naturalness of virgin olive oils and is often supplemented with chemicals and preservatives to develop a strong taste that is good for cooking and adding flavor to bland foods. It has an acidity level of less than 0.5% at giving it a long shelf life. It lacks an overall quality of taste and color and is much lighter in color. Pure or regular olive oil is also previously known as uh, pure olive oil in kind of the middleman of olive oil because it blends qualities of both virgin 
and refined olive oils. Around 85% is refined and 15% is virgin. Its acidity level can be no more than 1.5% and it's a good option for frying and searing. Although it has some taste and is of slightly better quality than refined oil, it should not be consumed raw. Pumice, instead of being made from the pressed olives, olive pumice oil is made from the leftovers. The paste-like material that is created as a byproduct during pressing. This oil is extracted from the pumice or pulp from the fruit when the use of chemicals are used in the process and added heat. It's refined and commonly used only by restaurants with an added amount of regular olive oil for additional taste. The grade of olive oil you use should match up with the occasion and reason of which you're using it. Virgin olive oils are meant primarily for uncooked preparations of salad dressing, sauces, and dipping oils, while regular and refined types are better for cooking and adding flavor to foods. Each different type of olive oil differs in price as well. Knowing what grade of olive oil is to look for will make both the trip to the grocery store and the preparation of your meals more efficient and beneficial to your health and taste buds. Two of the cleanest oils, sunflower and safflower oils, are often used when they are when you're looking for a clean taste for cooking on high heat. Sunflower oil is extracted from sunflower seeds, while safflower oil is extracted from safflower seeds. Both types of oil are rich in unsaturated fats, hence they're healthier to use as a cooking oil. Cottonseed and grapeseed oils offer a variety of clean tastes and a high smoke point. Soybean oils is one of the fastest growing oils in the United States and around the world. It is clean, slightly darker, and slightly more pronounced flavor than some of the others. Because of the high smoke point, these oils are turning up in more and more frying applications. Peanut oil, also known as ground nut oil or arachis oil, is a vegetable oil derived from peanuts. The oil has a strong peanut flavor and aroma. It's often used in American, Chinese, South Asian, and Southeast Asian cuisines, both for general cooking and in the case of the roasted oil for added flavor. Unrefined peanut oil has a strong roasted peanut taste and is used as a finishing oil. Refined peanut oil is used for frying. Sesame oil is an edible vegetable oil derived from sesame seeds. Besides being used as a cooking oil, it is used as a flavor enhancer in many cuisines, having a distinctive nutty aroma and taste. The oil is one of the earliest known crop-based oils. Worldwide mass modern production is limited due to the inefficient manual harvesting process required to extract the oil. Sesame oil is a key ingredient in many Asian, African, and Middle Eastern cuisines and is used in both light and toasted forms. This graph shows the level of monounsaturated fats in popular oils from the high end in olive oil to the very low end of sunflower oil. Basically what this shows you is that olive oil should be used sparingly. Sunflower oil is much more healthy and can be used a little more frequently and with more effect. So we talked about oils, but now we need to talk about fats. Fats are for cooking come primarily from animal sources and are solid at room temperature. Cooking fats include butter, lard, duck fat, chicken fat called schmaltz, shortening, although it is a vegetable product, it has similar properties to fats. Hey everybody, Thomas Joseph here with another Kitchen Conundrum. I've received a lot of questions regarding cooking oils or cooking fats and which ones to use for what. While it can be very, very confusing, 
I'm going to show you an easy way, a guide actually, as to which oils should be used at what times and temperatures. So over here we have oils that you should use over moderate heat. And what that means is the smoke point of the oil should be under 375 degrees. So what is smoke point? Smoke point of a fat or an oil means the point at which the oil starts to break down and it releases these funny little things called free radicals and it gives the oil a bitter, acrid taste. So you really wanna to try to avoid that. And over here we have oils and fats that can be used at a high heat. And that means anywhere from 375 up to about 500, 510 degrees. So I'm gonna start off here using the oils that should be used over moderate heat. And I'm going to show you a simple saute. Saute is at a lower, medium temperature, not a high, high temperature. So you can use things like extra virgin olive oil. So into the pan here, I'm going to add about a tablespoon or two of oil, and you can see it's dancing around the pan, which is perfect. Smoke point, you'll actually see it. The oil will start to billow out smoke, and that's when it really changes. So if you're at that point, you should start over and heat your pan to a lower temperature. So into this pan here, I'm just gonna saute some zucchini, a little bit of bell pepper, and some corn, some salt, and pepper, and something like this, an easy saute, is a perfect way to use these sorts of fat, because we're not really going over a 375 degree temperature. With this category of oils, all of them here are unrefined. So an extra virgin olive oil is basically an unrefined olive oil. Avocado oil, this dark color, you can tell it's unrefined. As you refine oils, the temperature or the smoke point goes up and the highest heat oil we have here is safflower oil and this can go up to 510 degrees. So this is what we love to use whenever we're searing meats. Now I'm gonna crank this pan up to the hottest it can get and I'm gonna add a little bit of safflower oil to the pan. So my pan is nice and hot, the oil is shimmering, that means it's at temperature and I'm going to sear my pork chop here you can hear the heat. You can actually hear the heat. So I'm gonna give the pork chop a little bit of a flip and look at that, the nice golden brown crust. And that's because we're searing at such a high, high temperature. So now that you know which oils to pick up at the supermarket, the proper way to store oils would be in a cool, dark place, a place that's free of moisture and away from any heat source. You don't want to store your bottle of oil next to the stovetop. That's a bad idea because it will affect the rate of rancidity. So away from the stove, in a dark place, capped off so that there's no air. And if it does come in one of these clear glass jars, either decant it into something that's darker or store it in your pantry so that there's no chance your oil is going rancid. There you go. Kitchen conundrum solved. Vinegar has been around since the ancient Babylonians over 5,000 years ago. From ancient Egypt to China, Japan, and the Mediterranean, vinegar has evolved over time using many ingredients as its base from beer and figs to rice, apples, grapes, grains, and fruits. Wine vinegar is either made from red or white wine. Cooks use vinegar for many purposes such as pickling, deglazing pans, marinating meats, making sauces, and is found in certain desserts even. Red wine vinegar is commonly used in the Mediterranean countries, being a common staple in most French homes. There are several different qualities of red wine vinegar. The longer the wine vinegar matures, the better it is. Most red wines can be matured up to two years, while white wine vinegar is a moderately tangy vinegar that French cooks use to make hollandaise and béarnaise sauce, vinaigrettes, soups, and stews. It's also an excellent base for homemade fruit or herb vinegars. Wine vinegars also include such types as champagne vinegar, sherry vinegar, and single varietal vin vinegars such as Pinot Noir vinegar. If you've ever been to a place with fish and chips on the menu, malt vinegar is a good condiment to know and love. Malt is the term for germinated and dried grains of barley used in adding a rich, nutty, toasty flavor to some of our very favorite things, like beer and milkshakes. 
and the vinegar we copiously shake into our fish and chips, which is made with beer batter and therefore contains malt. What really great about malt vinegar is that it's made directly from ale. Just like red wine vinegar is made from wine, when the booze is ready, it's fermented until it's vinegar. The result is a milder, sweeter, and more complex flavor range than plain white vinegar, which is just acid and water. Besides being a versatile condiment in the British fried foods world, malt vinegar makes a great gastrique or simple salad dressing mixed with olive oil and fresh herbs. White vinegar is a kitchen workhorse. Aside from cooking with it, it's commonly used as a cleaning product, but it also uses it as a lot for cooking. It's not fancy and it's harsher on the palate than other vinegars, but it is clean. Ne a neutral sharpness also makes it a perfect base for adding your own accents, such as honey and herbs, and spices and mustards to create vinaigrettes, marinades, or pickling liquid. You'll taste white vinegar and ketchup where it's perfectly balanced the overall sweet and savory flavors of the tomato and it's summer perfection when zipping up a creamy potato salad. Apple cider vinegar is a pantry essential. It works particularly well in pork dishes for marinades or added to a chutney with recipes that include apples or cabbage or in a smoky sweet barbecue sauce. It's great in vinaigrettes and can be substituted for red wine vinegar in a pinch. A few quick squirts will also add balance to your soup or stew. Made from fermented apple cider, this vinegar will be fruitier, slightly sweet flavor to whatever it's added to. It's light brown in color and can be found as a clear liquid or in a cloudy, unfiltered versions. They are interchangeable in cooking. The unfiltered is more likely to be unpasteurized or organic. And some people prefer to use unfiltered simply because it's less refined. A relative newcomer to the vinegar market, having been discovered in Japan in the mid 1800s to supply the burgeoning popularity of sushi in that country, this vinegar created from fermented rice has a mild acidity and slightly sweet flavor. This is the mellowest on the list of all the vinegars and is great for seasoning any dish where you need some tang, but don't want your vinegar to overpower it. When purchasing rice vinegar, you'll see regular and seasoned options. The seasoned rice vinegar is sweeter due to the added sugar and salt and can even be used as a dip. If you have room for only one, go for the unseasoned. You can adjust flavors as needed per use. Once you bring this guy into rotation, you'll be reaching for it all the time. Black Chinese vinegar, also known as Qinggang vinegar, has a woody, smoky flavor and is traditionally made from glutinous rice or sorghum. Black vinegar is common sour component in many number of dishes found in southern China, but also widely known in the United States as a dipping sauce for dim sums and a common meat marinade. Flavored vinegars are typically a neutral vinegar, such as cider, with the addition of a flavor component, such as strawberries, raspberries, peaches, tarragon, or etc. One of the most complex and flavorful vinegars, balsamic is also versatile. It can be used as an ingredient with a recipe, such as marinades, soups, and braised dishes, full flavored vinaigrettes, or reduced to a sauce. More refined, aged versions can be drizzled over fruit or cheese. Balsamic sweet, complex flavors develop as a dark reddish vinegar is fermented from grape musts, which are freshly crushed grapes, unlike wine vinegar, uh, which is made from fermented red wine, and barrel aged for a minimum of 12 years and up to 25. Older vinegars will be more flavorful and thicker as they become further concentrated while aging. They will also be more pricey. It's easy to feel stumped staring at a grocery store shelf full of a variety of prices. You get what you pay for, wisdom should apply here. 
This doesn't mean that you have to break the budget. A younger bottle around $15 is perfect for day-to-day -day use in your cooking. For the real deal, look for bottles labeled Aceto Balsamico Tradicionale, as there is no regulation around the word balsamic along with the vinegar style. True balsamic is certified by the Italian government and hails from the Moderna or Reggio Emilia region of Italy. Also check the label to ensure you see grape musk as an ingredient. Some cheaper balsamics will add caramel color to regular wine vinegar as ingredients. Modena, Italy. One of only two places permitted by European law to make traditional balsamic vinegar. Here at the San Donino Villa, they've been brewing up this black gold for the last 200 years. From one ingredient and one alone. Grape juice. Its coveted sweet syrupy taste depends on two things. Grapes with a very high sugar content, like this Trebbiano variety, and perfect timing. The key is to pick the grapes late in the season, when their sugar content is at its highest. Machines can't be trusted to choose the ripest grapes. Romano Speziale, on the other hand, has a seasoned eye for the sweetest fruit. I started to vend my own 60 years ago. And he's a connoisseur of fine vines. This is a good nata for him. Romano and his mate Giulio take a day to clear the vines of 300 kilograms of grapes. To maintain its exclusivity, Italian growers produce less than 10,000 litres of traditional balsamic vinegar per year. And to ensure only the ripest, best quality grapes get through, most of the work on this premium product is done by hand. But manually removing grapes from their stalks would take too long. The solution is approaching its 100th birthday. The Diras Patrice, or de-stemming machine. As spiral blades spin inside a perforated drum, grape juice trickles away through the holes, while stems are spat out on the floor. Only problem is, the juice comes out mixed with grape pulp and pips. In the distant past, it was crushed under the feet of children, but bouncing bambinos have been usurped by this mechanical press. Il succo d'uva è molto prezioso, non buttiamo via niente. In less than an hour, Giulio has transformed 100 kilos of grapes into 70 litres of sweet juice, known as must. This is where it gets tricky. As soon as he extracts the must, airborne yeast starts to convert the sugars into alcohol. Davide Lonardi is the third generation of Lonardi's to run this estate, and he doesn't want his grape juice turning into wine. Davide needs to delay the fermentation process. So he fires up the hob to kill the yeast and concentrate the sugar. Il musto deve cuocere per circa 24 ore a fuoco lento, lentamente, senza bollire. After 24 hours, about half the liquid has evaporated and the must has a rich caramel color. The key to making perfect balsamic vinegar is getting the sugar content spot on. Davide can't trust his taste buds alone. So to make sure he's right on the money, he uses an instrument called a must saccharometer. It measures the density of the liquid. The denser it gets, the sweeter it is. Oh, si. Questo va bene. When the sugar hits 30%, Davide moves on to the next stage. 
So far, he's worked hard to kill off the bacteria. But you can't make balsamic vinegar without some of them. So next, he pours the cooked grape juice into this so-called mother barrel. It contains special acetic acid bacteria from the previous year's production. They immediately set to work. The challenge for any producer is to create vinegar with a complex sweet-sour taste. The only way to achieve this is to mature the grape must for at least 12 years. Wine is matured in underground cellars to protect it from temperature changes which would turn it into vinegar. Which, of course, is just what Davide wants. So he matures his grape juice in the attic, where seasonal changes vary the temperature and help form vinegar. Qua faccio tutti i miei passaggi, i miei lavori e trascorro molto tempo della mia vita. Davide's challenge is to concentrate the taste and thicken the consistency. He achieves this by transferring the must into a series of smaller and smaller barrels made from different types of wood. Each wood adds a different flavour, whilst openings allow oxygen in to sustain the bacteria as they turn the sugar into vinegar. Every year, more than a tenth of the liquid evaporates. Left alone, the vinegar would eventually solidify. So Davide tops up each barrel in turn with liquid from the next barrel up. Then, once every winter, he decants one litre from each of the smallest, most mature barrels, ready to be bottled. But Modena's Vinegar Consortium won't let it go to the world's high-end delicatessens until it gets their seal of approval. Expert tasters check the vinegar's flavour and aroma. And hold it in front of a candle flame to check its colour and viscosity. If it passes the test, they bottle it in specially designed 100 milliliter flasks. Depending on its age and provenance, balsamic vinegar can fetch up to $4,000 a litre. That's the equivalent of two whole cases of vintage champagne and a couple of bags of nuts. Pickles are food preserved in a solution like brine or vinegar. These are often vegetables of various kinds, but any water-rich food can be pickled well, including fruits and even meats. Relishes are condiments generally composed of chopped vegetables with other ingredients potentially added. Relishes are typically not cooked, but raw when the pickling liquid is added. Southern chow chow is a good example. When usually serving as a relish in the U.S., it's specifically a pickle relish. Pickles are chopped up, seasoned, and used to flavor other dishes. However, technically a relish does not require pickles. Chipotle and adobo chilies, smoked jalapeno chilies, are canned in a red sauce that typically contains tomato puree and a variety of seasonings such as paprika, salt, onions, garlic, chili, and oregano. Used for making sauces, chipotle mayonnaise, rubs, as well as other recipes. The smaller Moita jalapeno chili used for making chilies and adobo rather than the larger mejo chili. The term chutney refers to the number of sauces or the dry base for such sauces native to the Indian subcontinent, forming an integral part of the cuisines of the Indian subcontinent. Chutneys may be realized in such forms as tomato relish, a ground peanut garnish, or yogurt sauce, cucumber, spicy coconut, spicy onion, or mint dipping sauce. An offshoot that took root in Indian cuisine is usually a tart fruit such as a sharp apple, rhubarb, and damson pickle uh, made milder by an equal weight of sugar, uh, usually Demerara sugar or brown sugar to replace jaggery and some Indian sweet chutneys. 
Vinegar was added to the recipe for English-style chutney that traditionally aims to give a long shelf life so that autumn fruits can be preserved for use throughout the year, such as jams and jellies or pickles, for else, uh, or else to be sold as a commercial product. Indian pickles are mustard oil uh, as a pickling agent. But uh, Anglo-Indian-style chutney uses malt or cider vinegar, which just produces a mild product that in the Western cuisine is often eaten and with hard cheeses or with cold meats and, and uh, fowl, uh, typically in uh, cold pub lunches. To the uninitiated, fish sauce might seem like an odd concept. Like soy sauce, it's both a condiment and an ingredient and it's full of glutamates that enhance flavor and food. But while soy sauce is made from comparatively mild tasting fermented soybeans and grains, fish sauce gets its signature flavor from something far more pungent, fermented anchovies. Manufacturing methods vary among producers, but the basic process is the same. Fresh whole anchovies are layered with sea salt and left to ferment in vats for at least 12 months. Over time, the fish breaks down and the salty liquid that forms is collected and filtered before bottling. It's strong stuff with an intense aroma. But there's a reason for this pungent sauce uh, is a critical component for many Asian cuisines and is becoming commonly known in American kitchens. It boasts a rich, savory taste and has a brininess that brings out the depth and flavor in everything from dipping sauces and soups to stir fries and marinades. Black bean garlic sauce is made from grinding salted fermented black soybeans with ginger and other seasonings. Rather than using the whole fermented black bean and hand chopped garlic to make the dish, this sauce comes ready to use. Black bean garlic sauce can be used in stir fries, steamed dishes, and especially seafood dishes. Typically, when cooking with black beans, we like to use whole fermented black beans. That said, this pre-made black bean garlic sauce is a convenient jarred option that adds additional flavor to a dish. Ketchup is a sauce that is used as a condiment. Although original recipes using egg whites, mushrooms, oysters, grapes, mussels, or walnuts, among other ingredients, the unmodified modern recipe refers to a tomato-based ketchup. Tomato ketchup is a sweet and tangy sauce made from tomatoes, sugar, and vinegar with seasonings and spices. The, the spices and flavors vary, but commonly include onion, allspice, coriander, cloves, cumin, garlic, and mustard, and sometimes includes celery, cinnamon, and ginger. The market leader in the United States with over 60% of the market share and the United State and United Kingdom with 82% of the market share is Heinz. Hunts has the second largest share in the U.S. with about 20%. In some of the U.K., ketchup is also known as tomato sauce, a term which is, means a fresh pasta sauce somewhere, elsewhere, or a red sauce, especially in Wales. Tomato ketchup is often used as a condiment to dishes that are usually served hot and may be fried or greasy. French fries, hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken tenders, tater tots, hot sandwiches, meat pies, cooked eggs, and grilled or fried meats. Ketchup is sometimes used as the basis for or as one ingredient in other sauces and dressings. It may flavor, may be replicated as an addictive flavoring uh, for snacks such as potato chips. Mustard is a condiment made from the seeds of the mustard plant, of which there are multiple varieties. The whole grain, a ground, cracked, or bruised mustard seeds are mixed with water, vinegar, lemon juice, wine, and other liquids. Salt and often other flavorings and spices are added to create a paste or sauce ranging in color from bright yellow to dark brown. The taste of mustard ranges from sweet to spicy. Commonly paired with meats and cheeses, mustard is also added to sandwiches, hamburgers, corn dogs, and hot dogs. It's also used as an ingredient in mayonnaise 
and many dressings, glazes, sauces, soups, barbecue sauces, and marinades. As a cream or as an individual seeds, mustards is used as a condiment in the cuisine of India and Bangladesh. The Mediterranean, Northern and southern, Southeastern Europe, Asia, and Americas and Africa, making it one of the most popular and widely used spices and condiments in the world. It's also popular accompaniment to hot dogs, pretzels, and bratwurst. In the Netherlands and Northern Belgium, it is commonly used to make mustard soup, which includes mustard, cream, parsley, garlic, and pieces of salted bacon. Mustard is an emulsifier, can stabilize a mixture of two or more uh, liquids such as uh, oil and water. Added to a hollandaise sauce, mustard can inhibit curdling. Common types of mustards include Dijon, originally from France, English mustard, a notably stronger and thicker mustard, French mustard, not to be mistaken with French's mustard, which is a this is a dark brown, mild and tangy sweet uh, with an actually invented by the Coleman's company in the United Kingdom. American or yellow mustard, which is very mild and bright yellow from the added turmeric powder. Spicy brown or deli mustard uh, is uh, consisting of coarsely ground seeds with the addition of horseradish. Beer mustard, well, as you can imagine, has beer added to it. Whole grain mustard, also known as Granary mustard, honey mustard, hot pepper mustard, fruit mustards, hot mustards, spiced mustards, and spirited mustards, spirited mustards being made with whiskey, brandy, or cognac, sweet mustards from Bavaria. Uh, these were sweetened with sugar, applesauce, or honey, and this is the original origins of today's modern honey mustard as we know it. We talked briefly about soy sauce earlier. Soy sauce is also spelled soya, S-O-Y-A sauce in many parts, is a East Asian liquid condiment of Chinese origin, traditionally made from a fermented paste of soybeans, roasted grain, brine, and aspergillus uh, molds. Soy sauce is a current form was created about 2,200 years ago during the Western Han Dynasty of ancient China and spread throughout East and Southeast Asia, where it is used as a cooking and as a condiment. Soy sauce can be added directly to food, used as a dip, used to season meat, or be added to an uh, item for flavor and cooking. It's often eaten as, with sushi, noodles, and sashimi. It can also be mixed with ground wasabi. Uh, bottles of soy sauce can be found at dining tables in China, Japan, Korea, and all over the world as common seasonings. The taste of soy sauce is predominated, predominated by saltiness, followed by moderate umami, sweet taste, and finally slight bitterness, which is hard to perceive due to the masking effect of, other, of the other tastes. The overall flavor of soy sauce is a result of the balance and interaction among different taste components. The saltiness is largely attributed to the presence of NaCl or common table salt in the brine. Tamari made mainly in the Shobu region of Japan. Tamari is darker in appearance and richer in flavor than its soy sauce cousin. It contains little or no wheat. Wheat-free uh, tamari can be used for people with gluten or celiac intolerance. Tamari is more viscous than its cousin. Then, 1.5% uh, of soy sauce produced in Japan is tamari. It is the original Japanese soy sauce, as its recipe is closest to the soy sauce originally introduced to Japan from China. Technically, this variety known as Miso de Mari, uh, as this is the liquid that runs off miso as it matures. The Japanese word tamari is derived from the verb tamaru that signifies to accumulate, referring to the fact that tamari was traditionally a liquid byproduct made by the fermentation of miso. Japan is the leading producer of tamari. Tamari soju is often used for sashimi, 
Uh, oftentimes, other varieties of soy sauce and, uh, for sashimi are inaccurately referred to as tamari soju. The black label in Japan, by law, which clarify which whether or not it is actually tamari. Tahini is a condiment made from toasted ground hulled sesame. It is served by itself as a dip or as a major ingredient in hummus, baba ganoush, and hava. Tahini is used in the cuisines of the Levant and Middle Eastern Mediterranean, the South Caucasus, as well as part of North Africa. Tahini-based sauces are common in Middle Eastern restaurants as a side dish or as a garnish, usually including lemon juice, salt, and garlic, and thinned with water. Hummus is made from cooked mashed chickpeas, typically blended with tahini, olive oil, lemon juice, salt, and garlic. Tahini sauce is a popular topping for meat and vegetables in Middle Eastern cuisine. A sweet spread uh, uh, version of this, or sweet tahini, is a type of hava sweet. It sometimes has mashed or sliced pistachio pieces sprinkled inside or on the top. And is usually spread on bread and eaten with a quick snack. Wine is a naturally fermented fruit juice. The most common form of wine is made from grape juice. However, wines can be made from peaches, strawberries, apples, and other fruits. Winemaking process depends on choices made by the winemaker, such as fermentation levels and tannins. So let's discuss some of the different types of wine from red wine, white wine, and rosés. Sparkling wine is a wine with significant levels of carbon dioxide in it, making it fizzy. While this phrase commonly refers to champagne, the European Union countries legally reserve that term for products exclusively produced in the Champagne region of France. Sparkling wine is usually either white or rosé, but there are examples of red sparklings such as the Italian Borchetta, uh, the Lambrusco, and the Australian Sparkling Shiraz, made from Madrasas grapes. The sweetness of sparkling wine can range from very dry brute styles to sweeter due or dolce styles. The sparkling quality of these wines come from the carbon dioxide content that may be the result of natural fermentation either in the bottle, as with the traditional method, or in a large tank designed to withstand the pressures involved. Uh, this is also known as the Charmat process, or as a result of simple carbon dioxide injection in some cheaper sparkling wines. Port wine from Portugal is a fortified wine produced with distilled grape spirits exclusively in the Douro Valley of the northern uh, provinces of Portugal. It's typically a sweet red wine, often served as a dessert wine, although it comes in a dry, semi-dry, and white varietals. Fortified wines in the style of port are also produced outside of Portugal, including in Argentina, Australia, Canada, France, India, South Africa, Spain, and the United States. However, under the European Union protected uh, designation of origin guidelines, only the product from Portugal may be labeled as Port or Porto. While the names Oporto, Porto, and Vino de Porto have been recognized as foreign, uh, non-generic names for port wine originating from Portugal as well. Sherry is a fortified wine made from grapes, uh, white grapes that are grown near the city of Juarez de la Frontera in Andalusia, Spain. Sherry is produced in a variety of styles made predominantly from the Palomino grape, ranging from light versions similar to table wines, such as uh, Manzanillo or Fino, to darker and heavier versions that have been allowed to oxidize as they age in barrels, such as the more uh, darker, richer of the Olorosos. Sweet dessert wines are also made from uh, Pedro Jimenez or Moscatel grapes and are sometimes blended with Palomito-based sherries. 
Madeira is a fortified wine made from the Portugal Madeira Islands uh, off the uh, coast of Africa. Madeira is produced in a variety of styles ranging from dry wines, which can be consumed on their own as an aperitif, to sweet wines usually consumed with dessert. Cheaper cooking versions are often flavored with salt and pepper for use in cooking, but these are not fit for consumption as a beverage. Marsala is fortified wine, dry or sweet, produced in the region surrounding uh, the Italian city of Marsala in Sicily. Marsala first received a Demonstration de Originale Controlate uh, status in 1969. The European Union grants protective designation of origin status to Marsala, and most other countries limit the use of the term Marsala to products from the Marsala area. Wine labels are an important source of information for customers since they tell the type of and origin of the wine. The label is often the only source that the buyer has for evaluating the wine before purchasing it. Certain information is originally included in the wine, able, wine label, such as the country of origin, quality, type of wine, alcoholic degree, producer, bottler, or importer. In addition to these national labeling requirements, producers may include their website address and a QR code with vintage specific information. Wines can be labeled by wine type, grape varietal, region or place of origin, vineyard name, trade name or bottler. In general, Old World wines or European and Mediterranean areas are based on the area and the producer where the New World of the Americas concentrate on the varietal, but even those lines are being blurred these days. In order for the wine to be labeled by the varietal, it must contain 75% of that particular grape in the United States. As you can see from this chart, there are approximately 91 red grape varietals and 94 white grape varietals, not counting new hybrids being developed even today. Some of the most popular red grape varietals are Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Shiraz or Syrahs, Malbec, Zinfandel. Some of the most popular white wine varieties are Chardonnay and Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, Chenin Blanc, Moscato. Wines are evaluated on four qualities, aroma, bouquet, taste, and body. Beer is made from water, hops, barley or malt, and fermented yeast. There are several different types of beer. Typically we break beer into two different categories, ales and lagers. In the ales category we have pale ale and brown ale and red ales. These are very familiar to us in the United States, but we also have porters and stouts. Lagers are things such as Pilsners and Box. If you've ever had a Budweiser, you've had a Pilsner. When we select beers for flavoring ingredients, there are some factors we need to consider. Usage. From beer batter to marinades, beers can be used to add flavor, tenderize, add moisture, and add flavor. Bitterness. Hops add bitterness. The more hops, the more bitter the beer. This may sometimes require the addition of sugar to the ingredients. Colors. Red, light, brown, dark. These colors add dimension to the food, such as beer batter or marinades. And of course, flavors. We want to match flavors or adding a new flavor to the equation. So let's discuss some of the distilled spirits that can be used for flavorings. Gin, rum, tequila, and vodka are some very predominant flavors when used in cooking. We can use these to make uh, a vodka sauce or we can use tequila as a marinade for chicken. Uh, rum is an excellent marinade and has the, uh, the taste of the sugar canes and gin gives us the flavors of the juniper berries with the uh, almost pine taste to it. Brandy is produced by distilling wine and is typically taken as an after dinner drink. 
The term brandy also denotes liquors obtained from uh, the wines of other fruits as well, and there are many different types of brandy across the winemaking regions of the world, including cognac and almanac. VS, or very special, uh, designates a blend in which the youngest brandies have been stored at least two years in the cask. VSOP, or very superior, old pale, this is a reserve brand that designates uh, a blend in which the youngest brandy is stored for at least four years in the cast. XO or extra old or Napoleon designates a blend in which the youngest brandy is stored for at least six years in the cask. Fruit-based brandies are common, uh, very popular flavoring components in food. One of the most commonly used is Calvados or apple brandy. If you've ever had things such as French onion soup, you have probably had Calvados in that soup. Also, Kirswasser, which is a cherry flavored brandy. Frambois, which is raspberry flavored. Pois, which is pear flavored. And this one, which I'm not even gonna try and pronounce, which is plum flavored. From Scotch with its peat moss and charcoal flavors to the Irish whiskey, which is a little more well, whiskey forward as opposed to its Scottish cousin. Bourbon is an American classification of whiskey and is traditionally used in the Kentucky region, but all in all, it is a classification which uh, has specific qualifications for. Tennessee whiskey is an example of a whiskey that is produced in the United States, which is not necessarily considered a bourbon because of its legal qualifications. Rye whiskey is produced using rye as opposed to corn and will have a unique characteristic. All of these have a high alcohol content with a sweetness to them, which adds to the flavor, especially when flambéing. The cures are made from herbs, fruits, nuts, spices, flowers, and other flavorings. In a base of neutral spirits, brandy, rum, or whiskey, typically the flavoring components are added to that to give us the liqueurs. Cream liqueurs are made with cream. They can be traditional cream liqueurs or flavored with various different flavorings. Creme liqueurs contain no cream, but contain additional sugar. Some examples are Cointreau, which is an orange flavor, creme de cacao, chocolate, Frangelico, toasted hazelnuts, Blue Curacao, which is also an orange flavored liqueur, tinted blue. Frambois, which is raspberry. Midori, which is melon. Chambord, black raspberry. And Amaretto, or is made with almonds, such as this Luxardo. Here's how to flambe. Flambeing can be dangerous, but it can also be super easy, and I'll show you how to flambe safely. Here's what you need. First and foremost, an audience. This isn't the kind of thing you do at home all by yourself. Secondly, a good heavy duty saute pan. Third, some kind of fruit. Bananas, strawberries, apples, whatever you have. And then of course, a little bit of butter, sugar, and of course, your fuel some kind of alcohol source. And you can't use beer or wine. There's just not enough alcohol present. Your best choice, a rum or some kind of liqueur. Today, spiced rum. Begin with your butter, then preheat the pan. While you wait for the butter, get your strawberries ready. Flambe fruit is a great way to elevate a simple dish of ice cream, or you can add it to a slice of cake, or you can just enjoy it just the way it is. One of the keys to flambeing is to listen carefully. You need to hear a sizzle. Sizzle says hot. Hot means the alcohol will actually evaporate and burst into flames. Spoonful or two of sugar. And it's the butter and the sugar and the rum working together that forms the sauce. Here's how to add the rum safely and light it on fire. First, take the pan away from the flame. Tip the front of the pan down and away from you. Add your rum, a shot or so, and then back to the flame safely. If you're feeling it, go ahead and shake it a little bit. 
And this is perfectly practical right now. It's reducing. After the flames have died down, let the sauce just simmer and reduce for a second until it forms a glaze just like that. So what if you don't have a gas stove at home? Can you still do this? You sure can. And the way to do that, do everything exactly the same, and then when the time comes, use a lighter. There are a few guidelines, however, when using alcohol as a cooking component. Use quality products. Garbage in equals garbage out. Do not cook with wine that you would not drink. Many cooking wines contain sulfites and added sugars. Pay attention to the cooking time once the wine or alcoholic beverages have been added. It's very easy for these to burn or change the effect of it. Brown foods before adding wine or other alcoholic beverages to the finished dish, such as a sauce or stew. Once you add the alcohol, you can no longer get the Maillard reaction, the browning of those particular foods. And finally, alcohol and acids in wine may interact with aluminum or cast iron cookware. You want to make sure that you're using stainless steel or something that is not going to react with these particular acids. So let's summarize and discuss some of our takeaways for the day. Taste is sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Flavor is all of these with the addition of aroma and mouthfeel. If you can't smell, you can't taste. Herbs come from green parts of the plants, whereas spices come from barks and roots and seeds, etc. Vegetable oil is a generic term and can mean any number of different oils. Seasonings enhance, flavorings alter the flavor of foods. And salt is the most common seasoning in the world.